Hello, my name is Mike Keglovitz, uh, and I work with Colorado ABLE. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about ABLE. Uh, if, if people have questions or comments, uh, we're going to save that till the end. Um, you can either type them in or you can uh, also ask, uh, ask away, but save them till the end. I uh, wanted to start off uh, uh, talking about ABLE. Last week I went to a graduation. It was an organization that works with uh, intellectually and developmentally disabled uh, uh, adults, young adults, and they received training, uh, job training, uh, for a year to kind of defer their, their graduation. And the graduation was, was really exciting because each, each student had, uh, had four slides on a PowerPoint and they had, the first slide was on their goals and their second slide was on, um, uh, you know, what they wanted to, to, to do next. The third was thank you, the giving thank you to everybody that helped to, to support them. Uh, but the interesting thing was that every one of the students that graduated uh, around their goals all had financial goals. One, a couple of them, uh, one wanted to go to Disney World, a couple of them wanted to go on vacations, uh, another student wanted to buy a self-driving car, um, another wanted to send his parents on a trip so that he could watch, watch the animals uh, to, to give his parents a break. Um, but it was really exciting. Another one wanted to, to continue their education. And thinking back, even just a couple of years ago, a lot of these financial goals would have been very difficult to save for. Uh, but having ABLE accounts uh, has made that uh, more of a reality today. Uh, and, and I'll try to uh, explain what, explain what uh, uh, ABLE accounts are and uh, um, and answer any questions that people might have. Okay, so <clears throat> achieving a better life experience uh, is what ABLE stands for. And basically under Obama uh, administration in 2014, it was passed um, and uh, each state then had to also adopt uh, legislation uh, to pass. So it had a federal blanket, and then it also each state. And each state, it's it's specific. There there are rules that are different from Colorado, from uh, Kansas to Pennsylvania. Everybody has has kind of state statutes that that uh, uh, you definitely need to be aware of. Um, but the big thing about ABLE is that it eliminates the $2,000 uh, asset cap for SSI and for Medicaid. So before, a lot of times people at the end of the month to stay qualified, they would buy a big ticket item like a TV or uh, you know something else that that their account, their their checking or savings account would be below that $2,000 threshold um, because if it went over that or exceeded that, they, they would then lose their federal benefits. So the beauty of ABLE is that money that goes into ABLE account is exempt from, uh, from the calculation for SSI or for Medicaid. Uh, any assets that are in ABLE, those assets are not counted uh, in the calculation. It doesn't help on the income side of things, but it helps on the asset side of things. <clears throat> And once money is in an ABLE account, it grows tax deferred, so you're not paying tax while it's growing, and you also have tax-free access as long as it's going for qualified disability expenses. And we will talk uh, more about what, what a qualified disability expense uh, would be. The other thing, uh, it's a little different than the college savings account that a lot of people are familiar with, or, or a 529, uh, those accounts, you can have grandparents open uh, account on behalf of somebody. You can have parents. You can have aunts and uncles. Uh, with Colorado ABLE or with ABLE accounts, you can only have one per person. Uh, so that, that, that's important uh, that uh, you can't have multiple accounts being opened up on, on that individual's behalf. Okay, so the big thing is there, there's two ways that you can qualify for ABLE. Uh, both of them, the, the, the first thing is the onset of disability needs to occur before age 26. Uh, so for instance, if somebody had MS and they were diagnosed with MS at age 24, 
but then they technically didn't become disabled until they were 30, unfortunately, they would not be able to qualify for, for an ABLE account. Uh, somebody that was born with a with an intellectual intellectual disability, uh, you know, that would happen before age 26. So the other part of it is, if they were on SSI or SSDI as a result of that disability, they would be able to open up an ABLE account. If they if their disability occurred before age 26, but they're not on SSI or SSDI as a result of a disability, they can still qualify. They just have to go through a self-certification process. And what that means is that they would uh, go to their doctor and the doctor would sign off and say, yes, you know, according to the Social Security Administration's definition of what it is to be disabled, uh, you, you meet that definition. And th that individual is supposed to do the, update that annually uh, and have that on record. They do not have to send that into Colorado ABLE. We do not want that. It is protected under, under HIPAA. Uh, so that information would just be for, for your knowledge uh, that you would have on hand, uh, that if the account was ever audited or uh, you needed proof on that, that, that you'd be able to have it. So the important things are disability at the onset before age 26. I had one example of a, of a gentleman <clears throat> that called me and he was 70 years old. Um, and he wanted to know if he could open an ABLE account. And in his story, he didn't, he didn't start collecting SSI or SSDI, I don't remember which one. He didn't start collecting that until he was 30. And he was also discharged from the military from the exact thing that he ended up uh, going on to his, uh, Social Security. And initially, he had a traumatic brain injury when he was four. Uh, so he was able to paint the picture and his doctor you know, was able to say, look, this is, uh, these are all consistent, um, and so he was able to, to open up a, an ABLE account for him for himself. So the other thing, if somebody is capable of managing a financial account on their own, they can certainly do that, and they can open it up, open an, up able, an ABLE account for themselves. If somebody is not capable of opening an account because of their age or because uh, they they just, um, you know, aren't able to manage that on their own. It, it can't be a neighbor that helps them or a friend that helps them. It, it definitely needs to be somebody that has signature authority. And those three people are going to be a parent, it's going to be a legal guardian, or it's going to be an agent acting under the power of attorney. So those are the three things that can't, it, there might be a, somebody that's super helpful that lives down the street. Um, that's great and fine they just cannot open up uh, an account on their behalf. Or recently I had um, somebody call and it was an aunt to somebody that lived out of state, um, it, but they had no legal authority of opening up on their behalf. So that, that's just important to, uh, to remember. <clears throat> okay, so the one thing is, uh, ABLE accounts are not wealth transfer tools. They're really designed for, for the individual to use and to benefit from. Um, Medicaid, uh, if and when the person passes away, uh, Medicaid can come back and seek reimbursement for the services that they've provided. And that's from the start when the, the establishment of an ABLE account. Uh, it's very much like a, with, like a first party special needs trust, first party. Um, in those examples, Medicaid can also come back for reimbursement. In third-party special needs trusts, that would be money, third-party money, like an aunt or uncle or a grandparent. In those cases, uh, the, the Medicaid cannot seek re re reimbursement for that. But for ABLE, Medicaid can. Uh, and so if you, uh, you want to transfer money to another individual, you probably need to seek an attorney and find somebody that can help uh, kind of set up what, what you're looking for. So in 2000, this actually changed from last year, 2017, to now to 2018. Last year, the total amount that everybody could contribute uh, was 14,000, uh, and now this year it has gone up to, to 15,000. And it's very flexible where the money can come from. It can come from individuals. It can come from a trust. It can come from an estate or a partnership or families, uh, family members, uh, friends. Very, very general, 
a very broad, uh, but collectively, all of those people can put 15,000 in. Uh, and that's a, an important distinction from what the 529 or the college savings account, where each of those people could all put money in uh, and exceed that 15,000, enable its 15,000 total uh, annual. There is going to be a change that's going to happen next year uh, that's going to come down the pike. And if somebody that has an ABLE account is able to work uh, and they are working, um, they can put uh, the 15,000 in and then they can also put an additional 100% of the federal poverty limit, which is just over 12,000. Um, so uh, they'd be able to put just over 27,000 in for, ne for next year. So here are some examples of qualified disability expenses, and it's not limited to these. It's very general and it's very broad, which is a good thing. If it was specific, that would mean a lot of things wouldn't count. But education, so if somebody wanted to go to college or um, get job training, transportation, housing, um, health and wellness, prevention, uh, health and wellness prevention, uh, legal fees, basic living expenses, a lot of times, even with people that have a special needs trust, they still may open up an ABLE account. And the reason being is, out of a special needs trust, you can't pay for housing, uh, like rent or a mortgage. You, can al you also cannot pay for food. But out of an ABLE account, those are things that, that are qualified disability expenses. So I could uh, foresee a scenario where people might take money out of the uh, trust and put it into an ABLE account so that they can pay for things that normally wouldn't be covered uh, in, in the trust. The, the important thing is that the individual benefits specifically. So for instance, if somebody lived in a group home and uh, they wanted to get cable for, for uh, cable television, they could certainly do that. Uh, the TV and the cable would have to be in their room. Uh, it wouldn't uh, qualify as a disability expense if it was in a general common area where everybody benefited from that. Uh, the other thing is if somebody went out to eat, uh, they could definitely go out to eat and, and use an ABLE account for that expense. But if they wanted to buy food for everybody, all their friends and family that were there, that would not qualify as a disability uh, expense. Another example would be, uh, again, going back to the goals of a, of a lot of those young people that were graduating. Uh, three or four of them had that they wanted to go on a vacation. A vacation would definitely qualify uh, for a qualified disability expense. If they needed a caretaker to go along, they could pay for that. Um, if they were uh, paying for their whole family uh, or friends to go on, uh, that would not be a qualified disability expense. Um, it is expected that the individual keeps track uh, of, of the spending. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a bit, but you would get a, either a checking account, a checkbook, or a debit card. Um, so if you're going to ATMs and pulling out cash, uh, you're probably gonna wanna keep those receipts or have the receipts. Colorado Able, it does not collect that. Uh, it's expected to the individual that it keeps track of that. Uh, it, obviously, if it's on the banking side, uh, they would get a statement that would that would itemize uh, different things. But again, if they're using cash, that's something that's not trackable. Um, it, we're not collecting that annually or quarterly or even monthly. Um, but if the account was ever audited, the individual, much like uh, going through the self-certification process, proving that they do qualify for an able account, they would also, you know, want to want to have uh, where those uh, where that money actually went to. Um, so, uh, you know, going back to, uh, uh, it does cover a lot of different expenses. It also covers things to keep a house or household up and running. So um, it can pay for house payments. It can pay for uh, fuel, for uh, heating fuel, gas, electricity, water, sewer, garbage removal. All of those things would be qualified disability expenses. Again, these accounts are really designed to be used. Um, uh, rather than being kind of a wealth transfer tool, um, just because, look, Medicaid can recover. It's really designed for that individual to be using it to increase their, their standard of living or for saving something that, that, uh, that they're going to be using down the road.
Okay, so another number to, to remember is that if an ABLE account exceeds $100,000, SSI benefits are suspended. Um, no matter what the value of the account is, um, Medicaid does not go away, but SSI would diminish or would be suspended. And if the account fell back below 100,000, SSI would, would start back up. So that, that's an important uh, number. We also, uh, the individual has to have in writing that yes, I have every intention of exceeding that 100,000. We don't collect money that would put them uh, above that unless we know that their intention is, yes, I wanna go over that 100,000 mark um, uh, to lose my, my SSI uh, benefits. <clears throat> Again, we talked about this, Medicaid does not go away. The individual continues to have Medicaid no matter what the, uh, the account balance is. So there are two ways that people can use, uh, use an ABLE account. The first is uh, putting it into different investments that are gonna be tied to the market, uh, and the market's going up and down depending on how well the, the market is doing. So you can see we have aggressive, moderately aggressive growth, moderate, moderately conservative, and conservative. So the aggressive is gonna be mostly invested in stocks uh, through index funds, through Vanguard, uh, Schwab and uh, BlackRock, they're all index funds, very low fees, uh, down to the conservative option, which uh, would have more bonds as opposed to uh, uh, having stocks. So this is not a recommendation, but in an example, I could foresee somebody, if they had a young child that they knew uh, down the road that might, might need some help or supplemental income, they might put it in an aggressive option because they have a long time frame and they know that the, the child's younger, um, uh, that they might be putting money in uh, to really try to capture the upside of the market. Uh, and somebody else that might be saving for a car, to modify a car or for a car um, in the next two or three years might be in a more conservative model uh, where uh, you know the upside is limited uh, somewhat but so is the downside. So if the market went down and the conservative, uh, historically speaking, the conservative model wouldn't, uh, wouldn't go down as much historically in comparison to like the aggressive model. The other way that people are gonna be using this is the checking debit option. Um, so the checking option is through Fifth Third Bank. Uh, we don't have a brick and mortar Fifth Third Bank here in Colorado, um, but it's going to be a virtual relationship. So when you open up an ABLE account, uh, that that checking account is going to be through Fifth Third, and it's it's FDIC insured, and it also has a 0 0.01 uh, interest rate. So very low interest rate, but also the money is secure and insured if if uh, if something would would happen. Um, in this example maybe a family uh, wants to give a little extra money uh, on a monthly basis to somebody. Uh, and so they can have a little more independence and they have a card that, that they would uh, they would use for, for those expenses. And maybe they're putting in $100 in a month to help, uh, to help supplement the, the lifestyle. Um, and maybe some families might be using uh, both of these scenarios. Maybe there is a vacation uh, to Disney World that they want to save money for, and it's you know maybe three, four years down the line, um, and they also want to supplement their today living uh, and having a checking option. To have either one of these or both, it's uh, sixty dollars. Uh, it is, and that's broken down quarterly, so it's fifteen dollars a quarter. Uh, if somebody signs up for electronic delivery as opposed to paper. They discount it three dollars and seventy-five cents per quarter, um, uh, so it's a it's a little cheaper. And uh, um, the investment side, it, those range from 0.34 up to 0.37 in terms of the asset fee uh, on those index funds. So again, the banking option is through Fifth Third. Uh, if you sign up for the electronic delivery, they waive the $2 a month uh, checking fee. Or if somebody has an average monthly balance of $250, uh, they also waive the $2 a month. 
uh, uh, fee on that. Uh, and if somebody wants a checkbook, I think it's an additional uh, cost. Uh, I want to say it's around eight dollars, uh, but I would refer you to the to the disclose the plan disclosure, um, uh, which is on the website. Okay, so if somebody wanted to enroll in Colorado Able, uh, uh, there's three simple steps. The first is that they would go to coloradoable.org. Uh, that's our that's our website, and you can see on the on the um, on the screen, that's what our website looks like. Uh, we have uh, the, the logo up at the top. <clears throat> the second is that really uh, you would want to look at the plan disclosure documents and read through that and just um, make sure that there's no surprises uh, with it. And then the other thing is you would want to gather up the information, have the Social Security or tax ID, date of birth, permanent street address, uh, email address, and then if you're going to link a, a checking or savings account uh, uh, because you're going to fund the, the account on a monthly basis or transfer money back and forth, you would want to have that information as well. And the, as well, if somebody doesn't have access to a computer, you can also call uh, the enrollment number and you can request a, a paper copy uh, to sign up uh, for it. So the other really cool thing that Colorado Able has is that the Colorado Fund for People with Disabilities is a partner with us on, on this project. And uh, basically, for anybody that needs uh, assistance, enrollment assistance, it's free. They're, they're there to, to help you through that process. Um, and they also uh, can serve in other capacities. So they can serve as a, as a trusted ally, an advisor, or even a power of attorney on the account. Um, if somebody has outlived their uh, guardians and parents, um, this is a really good uh, uh, resource that, that they can fill. It does cost an additional amount for some of those services, uh, but it's, it's fairly reasonable. Um, they can also help with training classes, developing a budget. If somebody needs help on selecting investment options, uh, they can help with that. The other thing that uh, Colorado Fund uh, specializes in, they, they, they're a nonprofit that works with um, uh, setting up special needs trusts for folks. So um, a lot of times I've, I've gotten a lot of calls where people have more than 15,000 uh, to put into account. They don't want to become ineligible. Uh, and, you know, it might be some life insurance that a parent passed away and put it in, in their name. Um, Colorado Fund is an excellent resource of, of figuring out um, what would be the best strategy so that that uh, individual doesn't lose their, their federal benefits, but also can put some of that money away uh, uh, for, for later or saving for something. And their phone number uh, is, is listed there, 720-236-0034. Uh, again, my name is was Mike uh, Keglovitz, um, and this is my contact information. My direct line is 303-376-8833, um, and my email address is mkeglov, as in Victor, I-T-S, at collegeinvest.org. Um, some folks might ask, wait a minute, this is Able. why uh, does Mike work with College Invest? Um, to give you a little background on that one, um, uh, college, when, when the Obama administration passed Able, they said, look, Able accounts act and feel a lot like a college savings account, so we're gonna kind of house this in the same place that each state takes care of the college savings in, in the state. Um, so that's how it's part of the department or the College Invest. And College Invest is a self-funded, independent uh, part of the Department of Higher Education here in the state of Colorado. Um, just to, to give a little, uh, a little background on that. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Has anybody typed questions or have any questions for me? Um, so, you know, just going back to, to the example of those, the, the the graduation I went to last last week, um, it was just really exciting to see that now a lot of these financial goals that that folks in the past really struggled with, um, 
ABLE really gives them an avenue to be able to save for things that they've never been able to save for uh, before. Self-driving cars, uh, vacations, um, education, all of these things, it's a, it's a whole opportunity that, that uh, uh, really is exciting to, to be a part and to bring that to Colorado. If anybody has any other questions, uh, maybe it comes up uh, later on after, uh, after you've heard this, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, give me a call. Uh, if I don't know the answer, I can uh, definitely direct you uh, to a place that, uh, that can help.